um, I'm already, I already assume I'm going to get canceled. So just, just live your life like you're going to get canceled. So Tim Ferriss wrote this a while back. Uh, he was like, because Tim Ferriss does what he does, and of course he's got kind of a social media presence. So I'm going to share like, this on uh, Facebook here. He purposefully puts things that are um, a lot of other people probably would not want public. And uh, he talks about the reason why he does it, and it's that he never wants uh, anything to get out in front of him. He just tells everyone anyway. Uh, so at that point, it's known. So if you want to work with him, like you just know that, hey, he did this in France two years ago. He wrote like, oh, a 10 page funny. blog article on it. Um, All right, let's see. It's called uh, Real Estate Experience. Is it uh, live? Yeah. I don't know if video is on, but audio is. So you should see it on both the page and the group. And I was just going to share it from there. Uh, I'm heading to the page now. So I've been going 100 miles an hour, and uh, apparently I didn't tell Nicole that you can actually come out in person. Hey, Nicole. It's just happening now. So it's not pushing on Facebook? All right, so we got timed out. Um, <laughs> start over. <laughs> I wonder if we can add. Can you add a destination? Go ahead and add it click on the real estate experience. Uh, there should be two of them. There's a page and uh, yeah, well, there's two. Yeah, there's a page in a, in a group. Did you see it pushing on? Okay. Check it out. Yeah, it's not going to the page. I don't know where to share it. Well, once it connects to the page, then you can share it to your okay. personal. Um, what's Rob doing? Working? All right. There we go, we're live. Is that the Brio 4K? Yep. You like it? Is that where you're doing all your vir virtual lives from? I, during the pandemic, I, I tried to That one's in the studio. Okay. All right. So that was like, uh, you couldn't find those during the pandemic. They're gone. Or they were being resold for like a thousand. Really? It's 175 bucks. Mm -hmm. I have the uh, 1080p one, but. Uh, but I found the there's the cam link 4k you yeah. know so I can put my uh, regular camera off and connect that to my computer and uh, actually bought that from brand and oh, I got the cam link and then I brought the camera from brand um, yeah so uh, I don't know what you expected this is about what we expected Okay, I thought there might be a few people here, but oh, that's all this, right. You, uh, I, I, I'm sure. Well, so uh, this was Jason did this before the pandemic, and I always thought it was pretty neat. And I didn't remember it was him specifically. And then um, I've seen this done in other formats, so I was I was like, hey, let's just go out and have that conversation. It's like. You go to a networking event, you see a couple of successful people in a small group talking. Well, what are they talking about? And what if that was live streams? So I was like, well, that'd be interesting. Oh, so, yeah, someone used to do that. I didn't remember who it was. And then I went back in the feed and said, okay, that was Jason. Let's see if he wants to do that again. Because I watched some of them. They were pretty entertaining. I was entertaining. Some of them were three or four hours, and there is some crazy awesome stuff in there yeah there's it's, it's the entertaining the whole idea is you if you could be a fly on the wall listening to folks that are in the trenches doing business today what would you hear without being the creepy guy just standing in the corner like kind of like eavesdropping so let's just do that put a camera there's no agenda no filter like if you say something stupid like you just gotta own it um after a few beers you might and uh 
Well, what I, what I like about, you know, what Jason um, and Rob do is the social aspect to it. I mean, obviously, uh, these guys are, and they, they attract other big brains who are, who are thinking one step ahead, not one step ahead, but one yeah. step ahead of you know, what the average investor or even the average experience of us are doing. But they also bring the social aspect into it. And um, I, I feel like there's positive peer pressure among among that group. Yeah. You know, they, they, they sort of pull people up and forward. With it's that it's the hive effect. Mm-hmm. So one of the mistakes that Jamie and I made early on was uh, we didn't we did it all ourselves because the information's out there on YouTube. There's nothing in this business for the most part that you can't learn on YouTube. The problem is you've got to piece it together, mm-hmm. and then you've got to do that fast enough in this day and age to stay ahead. So are, are we live, Eric? Yeah, we're live. Oh, all right, cool. oh okay. I just couldn't see it. No, so, I think you're. You know what Rob says? All the information's out there. It's the loading order. I'm like oh, this weekend at our at our private our money raising class, I'm gonna do half a day on marketing. And that marketing stuff I'm gonna share is all out there. The problem is you gotta piece it all together. That's where it gets and you gotta do it fast enough. And you gotta do it fast enough. Yeah. So you can piece it all together, but if you're 18 months behind and there's a market shift, like 48% of the market's now off. Yeah, and you're out there trying to hustle on flex. Uh, in this well, definitely. Um, well, not only that, but you've got to have enough throughput to what information you're getting back. Then you can actually make change, make make functional changes, right? A lot of times, what happens is you try to piece all this shit together, and then you're implementing all of it, but you're also not there's not enough throughput to say, hey, the information I'm getting, the results I'm getting on this end are not what I want. But I have enough to where I can go back in the chain. Like yes. it's causality. Like the causation is high enough where I go, okay, I need this and this and this. You just run out of money. That's what most people do. They just flat out run out of money. So that, that mastermind hive effect where you're getting one, organized information. And then two, through the group itself, there's the peer pressure like you were talking about. There's that hive effect in the sense that guy from Miami doesn't have to worry about sharing their secrets with a guy in Houston because, I mean, you don't really affect them much. So you can have very honest conversations, sharing tactics and things that work. So you all kind of grow up together. Um, and even within Houston, like, Sugarland is different than the Woodlands. It's different than, like, Jackson. So um, I would have joined one, like, sooner. Just one of trust. Um, yeah, there's just so much information to sort through. Um, another nice thing about this group, you've got people pursuing so many different strategies. So yeah. if there's something you're trying that you haven't done before. Uh, I'm listening to you guys. I'm just trying to share this on my uh, Facebook page. Yeah, and I wonder how the – so, folks, um, you'll chime in to the audio or the, the text. We'll, uh, we'll be commenting. Um, we'll do live Q&A live if we Q&A. can find where you're actually putting your well, cues yeah. in. Hey, it's actually doing a, it's doing live subtitles. I see that. It's pretty awesome, isn't yeah. it? Got a little yeah, it's going to a page. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you got questions or if you can't hear, let me know. A-Rock says we can. A-Rock says we sound good. All right. Yeah, look in the, in the text, voice to text is working good. It's uh, freaking AI is amazing. Um, so I'm going back to all of our YouTube videos, and I'm having to transcribe. YouTube's transcription is not great. Yeah, 82%. Is it? What it is about 82%? <laughs> well, that's just the words. Then you got grammar. Like, it's basically a 30-minute run-on sentence. Um, so <laughs> Maybe like, you just speak in run-ons. That's the problem, right? <laughs> there's that. Um, so I'm having to go through... Make those accurate. I mean, I'll keep them up. It's contextual, so yeah. therefore it's SEO beneficial. But getting it done. I noticed once we've gone back, pulled it, put it back up. The uh, the percentage of post because I think it's like there's about twenty percent more watch time if you have post captions on YouTube, so or on video. So we've noticed where we have like a three percent post caption rate globally on our YouTube channel. Now we've noticed certain certain videos that we have that we uploaded a few weeks ago now is like twenty percent. 
Mm-hmm. So I was like, crap. All right, well, we're going to have a VA. It's like, can you do two or three a week or two to three a day? If you do two to three a day, we should be caught up in six months. It seems like we're always chasing our tail on our podcast. Like, we'll have some problems with iTunes or all the other different places we upload our podcast. And then we're like, okay, now, now put two up a day so we can catch up the last couple of months. Like, some of this social infrastructure requires so much management. We're trying to figure out where these leads come from. Where's yeah. the, the but but here, here, here's, here's the... Here's the history of that. 40 years ago, you couldn't talk to any of those people mm-hmm. without paying a crap ton of money to ABC, NBC, CBS, or you know, a local radio station. Now you can do it for free. It just takes a lot of work. Uh, yeah, that's the truth of that. I don't, you know, it's funny. I don't even watch TV anymore. I'm watching YouTube most of the time. That's what when Gary Vee said, like, all these big companies spending all this money on the ad, uh, TV advertising. When they don't get that, they get their reports on how many viewers. It's like when you accidentally, like if you are going to watch a show on Netflix and that commercial comes on and you accidentally drop the remote or you can't fast forward to it, your eyeballs immediately. Yeah, maybe on your phone. Yeah. It, it's funny how that works. Um, and once you made that, that, that notion, I'm like, holy crap, like, when you look at the real estate side, real estate, we're so far behind advertising and marketing. It's it very archaic. So one of the... With the mom and pop flippers and the mom and pop realtors. Well, when you look at any industry, there's usually a market leader that owns 40% of the markets. So when you look at even big brokerages here in town, Gary Green... Uh, what's his name up? Keller Williams. Uh, who else? You start looking at some of these bigger brokers. They own one or two percent of the market. That's very fractional. So it's very yes, it's incredibly fractional. So the idea that it's like grocery stores, really. The yeah. Margins are so incredibly thin. Now the Zillows, the Amazons, the um, those companies will eventually it may even be a mortgage company. That goes in and starts consolidating the industry. I can certainly see that happening. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's why the marketing is so fractured and diffused because there's no market leader, right? The, you can't centralize it. No, another way to put it too, if you go to when you go to business school, they always talk about this. It's a you know the the reason stocks and bonds and all that trade on such low margins is because the market is incredibly efficient, yeah. and that each. You know, a, one share of Apple is, is the exact same value of another share of Apple. They're, you know, they're ubiquitous in nature, if you will. But then when you get into assets like real estate, single-family real estate in particular, you may have two houses right next to each other that are identical the day they're built, but 20 years later, one's in a completely different condition than the other. And so I think that naturally, because of that inefficiency in the marketplace, naturally, there's more variables. Yeah, there's way too many variables. So how are you going to get that consolidation? I don't know. I'm amazed nobody's gone out and built a home store, like a shopping mall where you could go and buy a house. You get in a van, van leaves every 15 minutes, and they drive around town and say, our company owns all these houses in this block. Pick the one you want. We'll do paint colors and that. Maybe, all the maybe blockchain solves some of those problems from a owner-to-owner transaction. Well, I will tell you what blockchain, I think you're absolutely right. Blockchain will solve because they have those non-fungible tokens now. Did you hear about the first first virtual house sold in um, uh-huh. India? Uh-huh. 500000 Really? $500,000. All you developers out there doing spec homes, someone just did a graphics art house and sold it for five hundred grand. Crazy. Well, a, lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the big players are now going heavy on built-to-rent. Mm-hmm. So, in some way, you know, they're they're going in there building the equivalent of vintage, you know, or at least that's their plan is once build something that has their rental homes, their apartments, their uh, you know office and or retail space, all you know, all built around. Yeah. That's the play now with 48 percent lower inventory. Oh, that's right. You know these. 
48% lower in the trade. Than any other commodity out there, it's like you got the same amount of buyers, if not more, you take half of the market off. How do you fix that problem? Well, I, I think the interesting, we could talk about that, but I think the interesting commentary is all of these real estate people that are predicting a crash. And, and I think that is so fundamentally bankrupt from a mathematical standpoint. It's absurd. But COVID, it, it, it's absolutely insane. We, um, I'll have to go look. I, I'll look at the last heart report. We are at a historic 48% low. 48% lower inventory. Yeah, 48% lower inventory and prices are up. No, and uh, sales are up 25%. Something insane like that. Let me pull up the first word. Current listings down, 48% lower inventory year over year. This is February. Uh, prices up uh, 18%. I mean, most of inventory. Right Active listings are down 38%. And uh, we're at 1.6 months of inventory. It's never been that, that low. That's a record low. Six months is considered healthy historically. Uh, Dr. Dotsauer has said, and they have 40 years of data that says this, you have to hit <coughs> 10 months of inventory before we have any appreciable loss in value. In other words... In comparison to what we have now, right? Yeah. In other words, in order for there to be reductions in prices, wholesale reduction in prices, we have to go to 10 months of inventory. We have 1.6 right now. So we either need 10 times as much supply or we need to shrink demand by 10 times. It does not happen. That's not going to happen. Uh, short of Iran decides the nukes. That's the button. only way it's going to happen. Uh, which, start flying. Which really all that does is everything just kind of freezes. I don't know if that, it, that would crash the equities market. Um, but it's a long solution. If you just can't, act, you're not building. It. No. Now, you have. 1998 to 2007, massive, 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 even higher construction build without certain limitations, which they're not even close to doing that right now. Maybe seven years from now, we could see that. Maybe. But it's but then you just you just compound the inventory problem, right? Yeah, this, this is still a maybe. We're, we're half. Right. We had, we had a housing crisis before COVID. Yes. COVID made that worse. worse. Like yes. three times. Yes. So I don't know how you solve that. Unless government, which the Biden administration, had, uh, they started saying, hey, we're going to help with the commodities. We'll help with trade, get lumber down. That hasn't happened yet. It's come the other direction. Uh, they can help with immigration, which should help with labor. Hasn't happened yet. They're going to help subsidize these multifamilies construction. Okay. That helps a little bit. What are we going to do? We're going to build Russia type multi-family gulags all over our metro areas? So the, the one solution I had read, this was seven years ago, was a white paper came out from some economists over Fannie, and they basically said, we have a real problem with housing stock in this country, and about 40% of it is in small multifamily. And the small multifamily operators do not have access to, the, to capital like larger multifamily operators. They're typically run by mom and pops. So... If you've ever tried to get a loan on a property worth less than, say, a million and a half dollars, that's greater than a four unit, it's still really hard. They don't want to talk to you. No, they don't want to talk to you, and Danny and Freddie don't have anything for you either. So if they want to solve part of that problem, open up 30-year financing like the small balance portfolio program Danny May has to small apartment owners. Add some rehab budget in there, and now all of a sudden you've taken a D-class property, which is half vacant because it's a nightmare, and we're turning it into a C-plus. We could get, we could build some affordable housing stock, but that's not going to fix something in the short term either. So this this whole idea, just to go back to the premise of the conversation, this whole idea that there's a real estate crash coming is freaking pipe dream. It's not going to happen. Unless you're in Manhattan, even then, I, you know what? There was an article came out said rents were down ten or fifteen percent, like in all the really like high end areas of Manhattan. But once they dropped, they started to get to 20%. People started leasing those places. Yeah. Up. Oh, then they're bargains. Yeah, they're, it's a bargain, yeah. right? But they maybe have a different problem with Exodus. And, I mean, it'll, it'll be six, four months before we get better data on that. But in the end, like, New York City, 
they should go anywhere. They're going to remain the epicenter. There will probably be a bargain in some locations. If you're an investor up there, it's maybe a good opportunity. Um, but that problem gets worse in Texas, Tennessee, yeah. South Carolina, yep. Florida, wherever it's moving. So I don't know how much this affects Texas, where generally, you know, zoning and government intervention, you know, government control is a lot looser. But as you all know, there's a huge, you know, housing shortage in, in California, uh, sending lots of people uh, welcome or, or less welcome over to Texas. But um, in the cities there, they're really talking about uh, getting rid of a lot, of a lot of the zoning restrictions on multifamily within uh they're really shooting to get density concentrating near public uh public transportation and things like that so i don't know how much that might translate to a place like houston well california's got a, a land problem right so i'm only tangentially familiar with la I'm driving around la it's like okay so you open up zoning where are you going to build this stuff a lot of it's an engineering nightmare and you got to take the uh, Australian bull weevil and relocate them to <laughs> their, their their natural habitat. Um, Glenn Beck did an article on this once. It was um it was a, it was a shrub. They were doing it with 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 uh, one of the stimulus programs or that big bailout they did back in like 2010. And um, so they were building this highway, and they ran into the shrub that was uh, almost extinct in the natural wild. So they have salt production, and then they're like, their photographs, Google this, and like, they end up digging all around this shrub, and who knows, and relocated it. Yeah. You can buy the shrub for 20 bucks at Home Depot. Oh, that's funny. Uh, so anyway, yeah, you gotta deal with that too. I've got a piece of property, uh, it's about an acre on the beach, like on the actual beach, and I've gone round and round with some environmental guys, and I would love to buy it. But there is literally a section the size of this table in the front third of the property, which is right on the beach. And this is considered a wetland. And I'm sitting there and I'm going back and forth with these guys. I'm like, can you buy some offsetting credits? You're talking about Dimitri City. No, I'm, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, but it's weird. It's like I can't build a house because there's literally like it's this big and it's this. But, you know. All right, fine. It's it's you know this thirteen square feet is now considered a wetland, so we can't build a house on it. So so smart plays that I've seen, like what Grant's doing, is because you can't build mobile home parks. Um, it's going out building subdivisions as like mobile home type communities. At least that's kind of what I'm understanding is doing. Maybe a little different, but building these communities like a normal subdivision, they just happen to have mobile homes on them, so they still get that feel. That first time home buyer feel, but now you're affordable because you're not having to build like put the ground up and pay 20x the prices. Um, the folks that can solve that problem in the communities, unless the governments are willing to issue more permits on mobile home parks, which that's not going to happen. Who wants a mobile home park in the city? That's the I mean, hard part about they'll have to have federal. Parks. They'll have to have federal yeah. pressure. But then there's going to be big lawsuits and all that. Yeah, thing. because, yeah, you're – so then this was, like, greatly a couple years ago. They were, And this is, again, through those bailouts, they were going to build a uh, – on the other side of Crab River Road, which is now 99, they're going to build a um, – it's a multifamily. It was a low-income housing. Oh, yeah, I bet that got crushed over yeah. there Can you imagine all the Greatwood folks figure out about this project? Mm -hmm. How happy are you? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah – I don't know if they got crushed, shelved. Um, it definitely hasn't happened. Surely, I'm. That's the highest per capita income of any city in Texas. Trust me, it got squashed and removed. Uh, I'm good for now. Medical Uh Yes, they do. Their taxes reflect that. Uh, <laughs> You okay. gotta live in Old Sugar Land, man. You guys live in y'all are in Greatwood, right? Old Sugar Land is like the heights of Sugar Land. No, you gotta live uh, right there in First Colony behind the wall. That's like two point seven. It's not bad. You know the big joke was when Sugar Land annexed Greatwood. It was like, oh, you gotta be kidding me! You're letting these derelicts in the city. Jeez. <laughs> uh, 
and they've since um so river park getting an ad yeah oh that's right river park. yeah across on uh 59, yeah right? so yeah. i'm on the i'm on the border of that so we're still unincorporated richmond uh which is you know good, good. tax wise yeah. um See. Hey, can you can take, you take me off the live stream? I'm on my phone. What's that? I just want to be able to get on the comments. Think to, yeah, turn all the way down so you can read yeah. comments. Uh, never done this from my phone. This is old school, man. That's how we used to do it. We actually just used to do the radio show. We'd stick one of our phones in the corner and just turn it on. Well, before I was talking to you, that's what I was going to do. So there's a splitter that you can get the phone, and it'll split off one from our, to our battery, the other one can go to a, uh, an adapter to connect the Blue Yeti. Yeah. So that's what I was going to do, and you're like, hmm, eh, I've got... Yeah, I'll bring this. Yeah, so much better. Um, I don't know how to get comments on here. Let's see a poster comment. Sure oh, never mind. I, I, see, I see where it pulls it in. Okay. So, put your comments down. If we feel like it, we may answer. Got a question, we'll make it up. Uh, yes, Justin, this is non alcoholic. What was that ordering? I can't remember. It's non alcoholic something. I'm a sugar. Actually, I need the sugar, to be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> you probably get less carbs from a nickel of ultra. That's uh, pink lemonade. You know, the problem I'm having now is I'm not eating enough. That's what I'm realizing. It's like... Are you still cycling? Yeah. So I'm doing an hour a day. Sometimes I'll do a two-a-day on the bike and I'm lifting. And sometimes I'll throw in yoga and everything else. So. I saw you doing the post-cycling walk coming over here. <laughs> oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> Cowboy? Yeah. Sure. Man, I haven't done a bike in a while. I'm oh, it's sure. a I'm having a cherry limeade at uh, three bucks a pop. And you're not getting a buzz from any of that. That's kind of, it's kind of rough. Are you no alcohol or is your beer? No, no alcohol. It's the first like two weeks was pretty tough. First two weeks. Now it's like, eh, it's not that big a deal. As long as I can find a, uh, you know, a non-alcoholic beer wherever I'm at, and, you know, we're hanging out at a bar somewhere, it's fine. But uh, where do you uh, go all in on the old duels? Oh, I can tell you all about. For any of you ladies that are pregnant or about to get pregnant, I can give you the rundown on that non-alcoholic. Texas Mist is okay. Uh, Heineken Double O, so 0, 0.0 is is not bad. Uh, there's a, it's not no label. Who is it? Carbach makes a non-alcoholic IPA that's terrible. Uh, who else? There's another good IPA. There's actually a good IPA that's non-alcoholic. I don't think it's no label. I can't remember who makes it. But um, the Coors, the yellow Coors, it's called Coors Edge. So the Coors Yellow Belly, they make a non-alcoholic version called the Edge. And it's pretty decent. It's about as close to like what a beer is supposed to taste like. Well, that's strange. But, from Coors. It's from Coors, yeah. I don't like Coors Light. I like Coors Regular, like yeah. the regular yellow yeah. belly is my favorite. And uh, I had a lot of really good memories. I was at a conference in Colorado, and, and they had that whole conference. So I just remember that conference. So much fun. Played golf, did the whole thing. The old, the original, yeah, the original course, but uh, it's seven bucks a six pack. It's like so. Geez. I haven't bought beer in a while, and then I went there and uh, I want to say they had 12 packs and like almost 20 dollars in Shiner. And I was like, what happened? Yeah, Shiner's not great here, so you gotta, it's all right. Shiner bought my beer, is it? Yeah. Mm. You know, I really liked Carbach until uh, this is brand loyalty purely for me. So they've got their, uh, and this is all interesting talking about this at St. Arnold's, but um, uh, their Bach, I what that Bach is called. Crawford Bach? Yes, Crawford Bach. Yeah. Great beer. Yeah, great beer. So they did, is they decided to, right outside of Shiner, Texas, buy this huge billboard and said there's a new Bach in town. Oh, I like it. So I get it. It's edgy. Uh, it's kind of funny, but I'm like, I mean, from a brand loyalty, it's like, all right. Off, so that was the end of Carbach for me. Well, a lot of Carbach. And that and them selling out to the. Uh, yeah, they sold out to InBev, right? That was the big thing. Uh, I remember that picture you posted at uh, the Astros game. Or something that was like crazy, that. wasn't it? It's like everyone for St. Arnold's, crickets at Carbach. Yeah. Somebody tweeted uh, Brock Wagner, who's the owner. Uh, he's got a business partner, but uh, somebody tweeted Brock Wagner, who's the owner here at St. Arnold's. 
and said, hey, what's your exit strategy? Because Carbon, everybody kind of knew because the guys who started Carbon, I think it was their second or third brewery that they sold. And uh, they grew so fast. They had a lot of outside capital. They knew what they were doing. Like when I first yeah. got introduced to Carbon, these guys knew what to do. And um, anyway, so somebody tweets to Brock and says, hey, what's your exit strategy? And he tweets back, yeah. That's exit strategy. He's never going to sell this person. I can't imagine what he gets offered. He's probably got standing offers from all the major brewers, right? Like anytime you want to, and private equity, venture capital. A lot of folks don't know. He started an investment bank, graduated from Rice, was making beer in his you know, dorm room, like a lot of us were back in the day. Right? Oh, so he's so, local. He's no, he's a local guy. Yeah, went to Rice, and I forget what his wife did, but um, yeah, he's a local guy. Lives in West U. At least he used to. He's down the street here. But uh, yeah, he got into investment bank and started brewing beer, grabbed a business partner of, of his, and then probably grabbed a couple of buddies in the investment banking business and started this. And, uh, do you guys ever go to the original brewers off of 290? Yeah. I mean, we used to have Christmas parties there. And you'd go into the uh, to the room where they've got all the fermenters, and it was a temperature control. So yes. we'd be there in Christmas time with like the jackets on, freezing our ass off. Or the first time I went was July. Oh, yeah. And you just sweat to death, right? Oh, one beer, I was buzzing. Yeah. Yeah, it was. I can tell you. You've been over there? I haven't been there yet. It's, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's one of the places I want to go. Yeah. Well, oh, this is Rolls Royce this compared. Is, this is the original. No, the original St. Arnold's is gone now. But it's, uh, yeah, it was pretty clandestine. I was on the bike team the second or third year right before they left. And that's where we met. And it was, that was wild. I still have my mug. Oh, do you? Back when they would give you a mug, uh, if you did the tour. I don't know if they did oh, that's cool. Uh, I don't Oh, no. It's a huge mug, so that way I can pour, pour fast. There you go. I, like it. Shiner, but... <laughs> I had my first, I had my fortieth birthday party here. We did it in the Investor Pub. It was really cool. I'd like to use that room for other events. Maybe I'll do something with our mastermind. Over there. It's a great. It's inside the brewery. Yeah, are they open in there? Yeah, it's yeah. it's pretty awesome. Can you do it now? Oh yeah, they still have it open. They call it the Investors Pub because whenever Brock was doing. His updates for his investors, that's where they all yeah. bring on, all right, guys, let me give you an idea of what's going on with, you know, the brewery and yeah. all that stuff. So, well, I was like, so one of my best network events, or the most fun I had, was all these uh, white pickets event when they oh, do yeah. it here. And, Are they uh, still doing events and stuff, or no? Uh, I, I haven't seen anything. I had to stop, so I had to flip in Fifth Ward, so it was yeah. easy. Check on Project. Oh, yeah, come, come to here. a white picket event, have some beers. <laughs> they were paying for beer and dinner, so yeah. it worked out really well. Then traffic just got nuts. Uh, living in Sugar wouldn't let the hour track. Uh, yeah, that's a poke, that's for sure. Um, yeah. What projects you're working on? Uh, you know, I guess the big thing is, and I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about this, but I've just been running my mouth. So it, Rob told me I haven't, I, I, that I don't. He hadn't told me no, so I'm just going to talk about it. <laughs> so we built the Texas Real Estate Center, and uh, we got an update yesterday. We still officially don't have our certificate, occupancy certificate yet, and we're at 83% occupied. So we suspect here we should get the occupancy cert pretty soon here. I'm not sure when. And then there will be a waiting list to get in that building. And we've already decided to go ahead and buy a building in Corpus Christi, and it's in Antonio this year. So we'll build two more centers in Texas. And then uh, I Same strategy? Exact same, exact same model. The model works really, really well. So is that um, so does that strategy uh, Houston, I get. Like the ecosystem for real estate in Houston is just so tight dead. Yeah. Uh, but I've heard that ecosystem is different, especially in Dallas. It is. Is it, is it Corpus Christi in San Antonio? How's that? It's different and it's way different. You know, this is something Eddie and I talk about all the time, where because he travels all around the country just like I do, and uh, the markets are all different. There's there's not the this is the largest real estate investor market in the country. I'll tell you that right now, bar none. There is no market bigger than Texas in Houston. It's no bigger, and uh, that's why I'm not flipping anymore. Yeah, yeah. There's <laughs> no bigger market than here. Jerks. Yeah, we're buying all my deals. Uh, so no bigger market than uh, here in Houston. And I think one of the reasons we're such a tight knit community is because that jet lending event has gotten so yeah. big over the yeah. last couple of years. Yeah, they've, they've been the epicenter. Yeah, I mean, well, before them was the rich. Uh, and but they, they were out. They were weird because they were at U of H. They used to get 2,000 people at that U of H event 20 years ago. And I went there, but it was a, I don't know. It was just a weird environment. Yeah. You go in, 
Is Rip still in business or are they gone? No, no, they're still doing stuff. Because they, I saw an ad that they were doing something at the Sugarland uh, U of H campus. Um, because I spoke at that U of H campus for them a couple of years ago. I've never been out there before. But, uh, I don't know what to do. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, debt I think has been a phenomenal. I mean, one, they've got the product, money. They've got a phenomenal investor at the head. Uh, Eddie, who's like a legend, and he's entertaining as well as a, a wealth of information. Well, you know, the dirty little secret in this business is it's deals and money. So if you've got a way to source deals and you got and you can build a hard money lending company, you can run the show. Yeah, that's so I've never had this conversation with Eddie, but I imagine the thought process is hey, I'm only going to do X deals a year, we'll scale to some point, but at that point, you know probably going to be within this range all these other deals hit them all i can loan them money yeah why not and then on to that really what he did was he solved his own problem his own money problem well if you just create well if you guys heard that story i'm not telling anything out of turn here but uh one of the reasons you joined homebusters is because they had a lending program so but if you look at that jet was in that nexus for a lot of the community building here you had chat wealth club uh, not well club because i don't think they were ever that big but you had jet you had rich rich was the first uh no rich was the oldest national in the country i don't know what happened it seems like that got run in the ground i mean it's literally nothing now. Really, like 20 I think years. there's a lot of drama between uh between the head people yeah but, well they, they shouldn't have any owners because they're non-profit so i i don't know what i still to this day I talked to previous board members and all that, and nobody could tell me exactly what went on. Anyways, so you had Rich, which is this awesome community, and then you had uh, what was going on over there at Jet with the Jet event and all that, and you know lifestyles to a certain extent because Dell had his his following. Yeah, 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 yeah go for it. So Dell had that whole operation running, and then um, Chris, Daryl, uh, what's going on? Daryl, so you had all that stuff going on, and then it just kind of. And then it kind of grew from there. So when you look at other markets, but well, uh, free beer and hot dogs. Well, yeah, but it's a place for everybody to. It's a. I mean, you really think about they built a community center. Did you Did you go to the SROs? Did yeah, you ever, you oh, I have been. Yes, I've been to the SRO in the back in the back of the room. Yeah. Well, I yeah. mean, you want to carry like two or three guns in it. Oh, well, yeah, I kind of felt that way. Uh, it was. I always felt like an SRO when I walked into that bar. I'm like, I'm getting in a fight tonight. Like that's the feeling you get when you walk into that place. And they're showing boxing. You're like, we're getting in a fight. I just go ahead and get ready. It's not going to be some of the, like my whole life, my thought was, you want to get back to where all the real estate investors are meeting. So you start drinking and hanging out. And then you beeline your ass to the car. Yeah, don't possible. bump into anyone. Don't bump into anybody. Like, it's just one of those bars. You're like, yeah. somebody's itching to get in a fight because they were fighting with their old lady earlier. Yeah, yeah. What's the address? SR, well, it's gone now. It, it's over. It used to be at the Northwest Mall. Right there off of uh, 610 and 290 on the south side of uh, 290. But um, anyway, so I've been there a million times. But going back to your question, there's only a handful of markets that have a really big community. Phoenix is one of them. Mm -hmm. Phoenix has a real, there's a really big RIA there that's really popular. But the rest of the country is kind of broken up. So to your, to your question, can you build one of those real estate centers in those markets? I think you can because there's nobody that's bringing all those. Well, that's a, yeah, if you can. Add the value, like Zillow. Zillow is all Zillow is doing is what NAR should have done a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, but if you could provide that, I mean, it takes time. Yeah. But yeah, eventually everyone always wants to go to value. Everyone always wants to go to something uh, of least resistance, something that's removing friction. Uh, that always wins if you can do it with transparency, good value, honesty. Like. Well, it goes. It takes you back to the idea when you look at some of these other companies that are that are coming to the marketplace, the Zillows of the world. I think Amazon's going to get into real estate at some point. It's just, I, I they already did. They kind of did, but it's not kind of take around it. I could see Apple getting involved, but just because they have so much damn cash. You should wonder why Amazon doesn't, doesn't buy like this. Uh, it's going to be interesting. Well, I'll give you a good example. So, you know the Apple credit card? Everybody know what the Apple credit card is? Do you know why Apple has a credit card now? They, they have to do something the with the cash. Yeah. What else are you going to do with the cash? There was a, a couple of articles I read on what, how many billion? It's billions and billions of billions, right? 
I was reading this article years ago where all these big fund managers were pissed at Apple because Apple, through their uh, through one of their funds, was buying up buy all the high quality credit. So like GMA comes out with a bond, well they would oversubscribe the bond, right? I mean they would because there's nowhere else to put the money. You got to put the money somewhere. That's why I keep telling people, like, if you're, you think there's gonna be a real estate crash? If there's gonna be a crash, it's gonna be gone in five minutes because there's so much cash out there. They'll buy all the distressed debt. They'll buy all the real. They don't care. There's it's like so the much worst money. time to sell rental properties. I mean, short of, I mean, if you got opportunity costs, but otherwise, that's the best hedge you have. To print yeah. so much money, rents go up, property values go up, you win. Unless you're in California, you got rental more. more oh time. yeah, yeah. But I mean, you you already have the problem. It's not going away. Well, here's the crazy thing. It's like, what what's the real? How does real estate really work? It's buy, wait, and sell. It's no more difficult than that. And what happens is, all these guys who think they're really smart, smarter than everybody else, they're like, I got to sell right now. I'm like, no, no, you don't. You don't understand. You're screwing up the waiting part. All you have to do is buy and then wait, which means don't do anything. Yeah. I realize how brilliant it's, it's you are. It's a ticking time bomb. It's an equity time bomb. That's right. Just so wait. I tell people, like, five houses. You're a millionaire. That's you right. You just got to let your tenants pay them off. Just sit there and wait. Now, you can't retire, but when your tenants pay them off, you got a million dollars. Yeah. Plus your 401k, plus whatever else you did. Like, it's not bad. It's not a bad retirement. So the number I keep telling everybody, if you're over the age of 40, you need five mil to retire. If you're under the age of 40, you need 10. So... You need ten million dollars. People think that yeah, I'm gonna go out and get a hundred houses. It's great. I mean, if if you want that, but if you just want to retire with a nice lifestyle, it does not take that much. No, it doesn't. I, you know what was interesting? I, we had a guy at our conference one day. Good dude. I've spoken at his events once. Talked to him a hundred times. And um, he said, "You know, Jay, we we're talking about commercial real estate." He's like, "You know, my my target market is to bring guys into our group one that." Night, um, that have got a real estate portfolio of 50 to 100 houses. And I'm like, and I looked at him and said, how many guys do you think in the city have 50 to 100 houses? And and then the next question was, if you already know how to buy and manage 50 to 100 houses, why would you ever go to commercial? Just keep buying more. Like, we're, we, oh, we really overcomplicate our investing careers. It's like, if you're good at, this is why you don't see Eddie with like a high rise or 500 200 door apartment complexes it's like look if you're really good at this one thing just keep doing it well but there could be market conditions like right now short of you're okay paying full retail and just making a long-term gain on it it's just different it's scale you'll be able to find your onesie twosies or you've got a very aggressive marketing campaign but uh, so, what is it? Pablo Luna, I think, put out. I said, hey, who's doing direct mail? And I was like, uh, I posted that that gif of uh, the Joker on Batman. I was like, the pile of cash. Oh, yeah, burning. just burning. Yeah. I felt like that when I was making money with direct mail. Yeah. Whenever I was spending $20,000 $20, a month, and I didn't get a call. Well, no, not didn't get a call, but I didn't get a deal because we went to the houses, and they're like, oh, okay, what's your price? You're not even close. Yeah. And it's like, all right, we gotta, we got to rethink this. Well, but the problem is not the marketing. The problem is it's how you fund those deals. Because you're looking at 7% minus repairs, right? Or 75% minus repairs. But the other thing that a lot of people don't consider is what is your cost of capital? And what does it cost you to rehab house? Well, my cost of capital is pretty not cheap. But I walked, there was a, I was willing to pay 85 cents. Okay. I, I've got spread. I even have private lenders that are willing to do gaps. I can do that in or cash flow at the rates I can get. Still lost it. Someone paid 90. And I was like, so So then here's the I question. Work, I work for that company. Yeah. Well, no, but, but these, are the, these are the guys doing it. I work at Chevron and make $250,000 a year. I've got $500,000 of the bank doing nothing. I need to do it because I hate the stock market. I'm willing to pay cash for this house. Mm-hmm. I'm going to hold it forever. I'll hold it forever. When I'm 65 years old, maybe I'll give it to one of my five kids. So here's where things get interesting. Because on that deal, you're going to borrow either private money or you're going to have short. Maybe you get a long term right out of the gate, right? You're going to have to do a rehab. So it's going to be off the market while you do the rehab. Then you got to find a tenant. 
there comes a point when you do the your, your total cost of capital, and it's much cheaper to go to the house next door, just put 20% down, move a tenant in the day you close on a 30-year fixed rate mortgage and move on to the next one. Yeah, for, for that deal, absolutely. Yeah, but there's a whole lot of deals out there where we get guys, we guys are mastermind, it's like, or who want to join, and they'll say, oh, yeah, man, I'm looking for 70% deals, and, you know, maybe you guys can help me do that. And I'm like, I can, but you don't have the budget. Thank you. You don't have the budget. You're not going to spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month in marketing. So why don't you just put twenty percent down on a hundred thirty thousand dollar house? You're at thirty thousand dollars out of pocket and cash flow six hundred bucks a month. Move on to the next one. Oh, I only have a hundred thousand bucks. I'm like, okay, well you're going to have to figure you're going to have to figure something else out because that's not going to work yeah. long term. And they can find the deals. It's just it's going to take more work. Yeah, they're going to have to. Right. Hey. Okay. Okay. You're sitting next to the camera, gentlemen. You got to head out. I got a, uh, a right. Zoom call here. All right. Well, yeah, we'll talk tomorrow. All right. All right. That's good. Good to meet you. How did you hear about this? Uh, or were you just hearing me? No, actually, I got a Zoom call. LinkedIn. Okay. Oh, yeah. Cool. And then I received like, an email. Yeah, I was like, oh, I'm going. I was in the area. Okay. All right. All right. And I What's up? Oh yeah, I mean, there's no break. It's just whatever happens. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, I'm getting off work and gonna start drinking beer with my own. All right. So you're you're almost on a break. So I am on a break. Yeah. All right. I'm Chris. It's been a while. Valerie. Yes. Valerie. I'm horrible with names. That's okay. It was a long time. Okay. All right. All right. What's your name? Jen. Jen. Yeah, Emily. Emily. Love you, Jen. Not, my wife is here. She helps me remember. She's at like the bar. This is Valerie. She's it like, met them many times. Really like it's okay. I do it with family members. No big deal. Where'd she go? Uh, I don't know. Oh, she's switching out. They're sending the new dude over here. Okay. She said she was off work. She's going to start drinking. <laughs> That's what I used to do when I was the table. So, I was, uh, here's my evolution. Here's uh, the uh, Actually, no, so Jamie and I, we started out, we're going to flip house. I flip house in college, we get married, and I drop this bomb in our lap. Hey, babe, like, it's like weeks after getting married. We're going to flip houses again. Oh, I'm going to leave my job. I didn't say that, but <laughs> she comes from a traditional, like, work hard. Yeah. She's a teacher her family like that's just their background so um she knew i did that in college but she thought it was just a college thing and she tells this story better than i do but anyway dropped that bomb she's like uh, she went with the flow and then we, we actually get for deals we actually we're gonna flip it trigger land we did it was a rental 2011 very smart no no, no strategy there it was just like hey why don't we just rent this thing out we would have made 20 grand if we were in the we made a hundred Gross. Yeah. The next house, same thing. We bought it like three months later. We would have made probably 25. Rented it out, sold it around the same time three years later yep. at 120. Third one, that was more like a base hit. We were like 50 on it when we rented it out. So fourth one, that that's the trend. So then we're like, hey, we, we got all the money now. Like, I don't have to have a job. Just quit full time, flipping. We do that. Oh, 2015, flipping. Now we got, I don't know what we get our first year. It's like 17 with a job. Yeah. Like 27, like 34, 39. But then it's like the margins are like 45 grand flips, 38 grand, 27 grand. Crap, we lost for you in that one. Yeah. Uh, it's like... When you start doing the math, it's like it's the same thing that you had. What if we didn't sell 20% of these things? Like, we would never have to work from an equity standpoint. We would never work again. Yeah. You know, the cash flow would probably just barely pay for this, but equity, we wouldn't have to work. All right, how do we change that? So we started buying rentals, flipping rentals, flipping rentals. It's good. Then we get priced out on flips. All right, we'll just buy rentals. It's okay. I can monetize that because I've got a way I'm licensed. Crap, I can't even buy those things. Mm-hmm. 
now say, okay, I've got the license, so I can wholesale stuff and get a commission yeah. while buying rentals. That's cool. And then all my lenders are going, hey, I've got all this money. Like, what projects do you have? I have anything. I've got this one rental. And more and more, like, hey, I've got 500000 Hey, i got a million. What can you get? Like, this is at good rates, too. Yeah. I'm like, so at the same time, I'm seeing these operators on multifamily, commercial, with brand selling, development, mobile home parts. I'm starting to put the pieces together. It's like, look, I'm in a position where we've got good financial resources, plus our own inventory, plus the solid operators that I know. It's like, how can we marry those types of resources into the structure deal? That's where we're at right now. So here's the here's the secret we ran into is because we had all these multifamily deals we were working on, and it was funny. My first one. The 27 unit apartment complex. And was that, that, that was, was a corpus. Corpus. That was corpus. So we go in and we contract this deal. And I'm, it is a legit, I hate to use a single family term, but most of the folks that are listening to single family guys, we were all in at 75% ARV on an apartment complex. Oh, what years this? This was uh, 2018. Yeah, so that's a home run. Home run deal. And we could not get financing. And here was the principal cost of the issue of finance. Bankers would say, how many 27-unit apartment complexes have you owned, Jason? And I'd say, I don't know. I think 100 houses a year. Can I give you that? Yeah, absolutely. I do. I just don't want to, like, enter, you know, whatever the description is. Oh, wait, you're a meter yet? Okay. All right. All right, two of them. There you go. Great. Know exactly where that conversation is going. Yeah, so they said you've got no, uh, you've got no experience with twenty seven unit apartment complex. Like, but five hundred houses, you're a nobody. You're a nobody. Yeah, you've got a thousand houses, but you can't do that. I'm gonna take this. <laughs> that's, so, what, that's what Jamie and I. We, we had a twenty nine unit. Same. Now this was two thousand twelve. We didn't have your experience, but I think your story amplifies that. Oh, yeah. You know, what, you know, yeah. what that looks like. But here's my point. You've got private capital to go take this down. This is how we did the building. We go in and buy it with private money and owner finance. Or you just do it 100% private money. You rehab it, stabilize it. you got six months of financials. Then you go to a bank. The bank, do you want this? And they go, so, so happens Chris now has experience in a 27 year apartment complex because oh, yeah. he's been running it for a year. They always look at you differently. That's right. Months. So on our building, we're getting bankers are verbally giving us the three, three and a half percent. You can believe that three and a half, three to three and a half percent on commercial loan for our building. And they're like, just give us six months of, of financials, to stabilize financials. We're like, perfect. So we're already looking at less than two years, like Q1 20, Q1 2022. We'll have that thing refined. Three, three and a half percent. Probably a ten year loan, twenty five year you know, You still have money in it? We're not gonna have any money in it. I don't know if we're gonna I gotta so ask our partner. I'm pretty that, sure we're gonna take all their the, money. Is, out. is the refi gonna be loan to cost or they're gonna they're gonna they're go gonna, loan to value? They're gonna go loan to value. So where we were at is the worst position because it's 2012, 2012, 2013. Buy this twenty nine unit, got a baby on the way. And we buy this thing for like seventeen thousand dollars a door. Try that. Yeah. Like that's what we're that, buying stuff for in Corpus. Yeah. It's like Corpus. So seventeen. Now it, it's run down. We need to buy it. Two hundred twenty-nine unit. So twenty two hundred fifty thousand, two hundred seventy thousand, whatever. And we put one hundred seventy thousand dollars in this thing. Mm-hmm. I was. I thought I was smart. I go and do all my refi um, due diligence before I buy. Mm-hmm. Bankers tell me, yeah, great, 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 do this. Well, when it finally that time comes, they're like, yeah, great. Well, but no, that actually doesn't work. Sorry, that doesn't work. And finally, we actually get in some hard conversations. And then it came down to, love your experience. Great. Yeah, you just don't have the commercial. That's we right. Finally, get someone who does want to do it. And they're like, yeah, I know you spent 170 grand on the rehab. We'll loan you 65% of the cost. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't need more money. Yeah, we're out of cash. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I was like, it, it's cash flowing. Like, this is, and this replaces my wife's teacher, five grand a month, net, net. Like, that's good. 
We sold it for an investor. We bought it cheap enough to know we could screw it up and make money. Right, right. We screwed it up. We still walked away with 100 grand. But the guy I sold it to, I said, this is worth 1.2 million. He got it appraised 1.2 million. Here's the problem. If I would have gone to, uh, actually, this actually happened. If I would have gone to Eddie Gant yeah. or someone who had commercial experience, no brain. So easy. Yeah. I'd probably still own Maybe still own it. Yeah. Um, I didn't. After I told that, I did the whole deal and I told Eddie about it. So he actually financed the acquisition. No kidding. Uh, well, I think we were one of the first commercial loans for it. Oh, okay. And, um, and he drove by and he did his due diligence. Um, he goes, hey, you should have just told me about it. I would have partnered with you on the deal. <laughs> well, I mean, I was 26 years old. What were you all in it for? So 1.2, what were you all in it for? It's about half. Jeez, you're in for 500K. You had 700 grand of equity. That's insane. People but do- what cost me? Arrogance. I, the whole deal was mine. Yeah. If I would have partnered, even if I want to be, if I had to be generous and give someone else seventy percent of the deal, yeah. Now, not only do I get the experience, mm-hmm. I, I get all. I know exactly what to do. I get the resources and everything. Now I can go do the eighty unit deal. Oh, yeah. Talking to the bank, yeah. like that's a good project you have there. Well, this is what we can do for you. That's different. So that's the position we're preparing. And I told my lenders, like, could I go out and acquire a deal? Absolutely. It's the operational and backside financing that it's challenging unless you're on an operator. The good thing is, there's some really good operators. So, one of the things that we do inside our mastermind is we bring in some of our guys to be GPs with us, general partners. So, they get that, they can put that experience on the resume, and put that experience on the resume. So, when they go out and get their own deal, they can get their own Yeah, yeah. So, that's part of our part of our group that we do because it's the same problem you said, right? You start to run into that issue where, where you can't get stuff financed and it's just it's tough. So, did you actually have to work? Is that why you're here at four? I'm sorry, man. I just got mass chain up front. So we all did. We all did. Yeah. What's going on, man? I say hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I got mass chain too. I think it's just because you guys are ugly. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are ugly. Juicy. Juicy. There are more realtors in our houses. There are more realtors in our houses. For <laughs> houses for sale. That makes, about, that makes sense. Uh, I mean, okay, on average, how many deals do realtors close per year? Average, if you go yes. average, average is like 1.2. <laughs> okay, well, we were all we said five. We're thinking five to ten. Well, okay, if you say an active agent, like that's yeah. that's yeah. the primary yeah. full time yeah. job. Yeah, that's who we're talking about. Most people like that. Outside of a year of experience, because the product, most of them will wash out within 12 months. Yeah, it's probably, probably three to five. So we thought five. Yeah, now, this is full time. You've already washed out the folks of the. Yeah, because you get your license, everyone has their sphere. Now, sister, best friend, you know, they'll work with you. But then they start to realize that it's a sales and marketing business. You're actually the CEO and the cook and yeah. the bottle washer. Like, yeah. you're everything. Yeah. But they don't. All real estate school teaches you is how to stay at a gym. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they didn't teach you anything about business. So the smart ones go to a team. Yeah. Or they get mentors, they partner up with like a really, really good agent, they make less from splits, like they get their feet wet, they get a fine tower, go up and go off around. There's all right, so we're how three many to I, five a year. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, average salary is a little over 40. Yeah, like 30. Yeah, 30. I, you know what? Walter and I were chatting about this one day, and I pulled you can go to MLS and pull up agent by volume, and I want to say top 10 percent started with like. 10 or 15 deals a year. Like, it'd be a top 10. I can see that. Here's funny. It was, it was really low. I looked at it. I was like, it's really low. Here's funny. So, we, we pulled that up for uh, 
like Grant was just, uh, I was, I was like, hey man, I, I was pulling up the list and I saw you're actually in the top six percent. I forget what it was. And I was like, you're over so and so, so and so agent. It was, that's their full time job. Like, yeah. And they're, they're actually really good. Yeah, at they're like agent. grinding. Like, yeah. Grant, to his own, he, he says this himself. He goes, I don't know how to do a listing. He's an investor. He's like, his, his, his biz dev and development investing, that's his thing. He's just got a good, he's got a good team. So I was like, Grant, no, you're actually over all these other like rock star, like they're the icons of agents. Yeah. You do more deals than you know. You know you're not doing do a do a let's see. Yeah. And you went and looked it up and was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Like, oh, yeah. okay. Um, okay, cool. Well, that's like what we were thinking. We were just talking about like our program and working with realtors and mentoring them, and it's like like on our program and throughout the loan process. And sometimes we're like, like, should this be known? But then we talked about it today, and we're like, they don't close that many deals per year so they're like while they're constantly learning things like they're not necessarily learning all the things we're learning from the lending side because they're not closing as many deals so they're not going through the process as often yeah they don't get the reps yeah they don't get they don't get all that information so we were just talking about it today in comparison and that problem's like, worse now just they don't have the opportunity there's a 48 yeah. percent less inventory yeah yeah, it's so, even harder on that end too. So yeah, it was just interesting to think about from that perspective that they don't get to learn as much as like a lending company or even a full brokerage firm, somebody running a full brokerage firm because they're not getting that many deals. So they're not experiencing closing that many deals or the process that many times. Yeah. Yeah. That they unless they the join a team. Like if you go join yeah, Lance team. Loken's team, Jimmy Franklin's team or whatever, where they're just pumping them out like yeah. crazy. Okay, they're gonna get the reps. They're not gonna make a lot on the, on the split commission, but they'll make more and experience and just get Gosh, the reps. I almost in. think it's better for them to like do it like that and get more experience. It is, but here, here's the rub: you're a single agent, you get a hundred percent commission on. I mean, whatever your broker split is, but otherwise it's all you. You come work for a team, you're a buyer's agent, 50-50. I know. Or I know. maybe less. Maybe and then on top of that, you still have the brokerage split. Yeah. So maybe it's like Keller with like a 70-30 and then you've got a 50-50 with a team. That's that's a hard pill to swallow. But if you can coach the agents like, look, yes, you're going to pay this for 12 months, but this is what you're going to do. Like, right. We're going to teach you this, this, this. And like, look what I've done over the past year. If you think I learned this easy, like right. you can go want to learn it on your own or you can get a mentee. Like, yeah. It's value, but you got to see past that. Mm -hmm. Mm, It's challenging. It is. But most agents, they're part time. They got a full time job. They're doing things on the weekend. Yeah. There's 80,000 real estate agents in Houston. Only 40,000 real estate agents. There's 40 something thousand realtors. So you don't have to be a part of the MLS. So there's about 40,000 part of the MLS. It's more than that now. Um, That gives you a little perspective on how it's actually yeah so that's i mean that's a lot of realtors how many in austin i don't know i mean it's public record you can look up there's i think what two million realtors nationwide sounds about right um so there's about forty thousand realtors in houston i think there's about eighty thousand or so in texas so houston just just gets yeah. And these stats are a couple years old, so. But it probably hasn't changed so, too, too much. You know, 120,000 in Texas as of 2018. Okay, there you oh, go. Oh, wow. Is that realtors or uh, it just agents? Uh, it says realtors. Tra- she does realtors. Okay. okay. Realtors. 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 Is it realtor or realtors? Realtor. 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 Real, realtor. <laughs> There's no way between the real. There's no way. What's the state with the most agents? California. 200,000. Well, big surprise. 200,000? I mean, duh. Florida second with 175. Not a big surprise either. It's New York guy. Wait, no, I thought he said we had 180. Or I thought he said we had 180. 120. Oh, 120. Let's see here. Two million active in the U.S. Houston got the second biggest MLS. Uh, yeah, that's that should be about right. I imagine Orange County is probably the biggest. Florida's number one. More important than so, so, Miami Dade. More important for the biggest of us. Like, we've got one of the best MLS systems. Like 
I get agents in other markets that are also investors and like they're using Zillow for data. I'm like, and then even buyers or, or sellers or whatever, they talk about Zillow here. I'm like, Zillow is nothing in Houston because ATR is so advanced in their tech and um, so we're, we're pretty blessed in that sense. This can't be right. It says there are only 66 agents in Corpus Christi. Be no, that could be right. no, that's not a no. <laughs> There's opportunity there. 14 in Lubbock. That's a special you got for There's only 25. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one guy. Maybe, maybe not. It's like uh, one person. We can move down yeah. there. We can take it's over the market. Yeah. Broker, his broker, agent, title company, pawn shop, <laughs> does your taxes. <laughs> It's like one room, you walk in, get it all done. He what does wills. I, see the other day? I right, saw a nail salon office, yeah. that yeah. was a nail salon, a gold shop, a jewelry shop, a waxing place. Uh, Is it a walk? <laughs> not even maybe. No, it wasn't. It was something like, somewhere that we went. It was somewhere. 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 It was like, okay. Funny. Maybe because that's actually the thing that's the thing. No, that's the thing that's the thing that's the And this is the thing that's 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 the I may have to uh, negotiate this deal on here with option. Uh oh. Is it one you're selling or buying? I'm selling some, some family members that they're selling their house. Well, take these two, which one's more nice? Absolutely. It's been pretty crazy. I got a contract on the duplex, though. Oh, I figured you would. Would you get it at Haskell? Uh, oh, yeah. I don't know, yeah. man. That'd be a hard one yeah. to sell. Yeah. Well, like I told you, I didn't care if it sold or not. And uh, yeah, it's pretty much asking. And for them, what you're getting, what you should be getting for dimensional rate, still over an eight cap. Makes sense. Um, oh, you're like. Calling them and negotiate a deal. Huh? Oh, well, it's options ending, so I'll do that. Uh, I bet you can see a lot of negotiations on the phone. Jason, you guys want another round or what? Yeah, I'll want some Daryl, what do you do? Real girl. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, you work for you? I'm on okay. a manager. What's your experience been the last couple of months? Well, I was on the investor side. Point of view. It was in 2016. But so the, the in buyers, November, back, well, October 30th, 2020, I decided to go back on time. For yeah. So this has been okay. Well, I think it's better for people who are like on the investing side to switch over or like get their realtor's license mm -hmm. because. Like you work with so many investors that are doing so much. There's so much more activity, I guess. And if you understand that side of it, we had a girl in our realtor training today, and she was just a real like normal realtor, and then she started like switching over to doing investment stuff, like working with you know buyers to do investments and just even wholesaling and stuff. And she's like, there's just so much more activity going on that there's just more to do. Yeah. Sure. Headliner. I got you. Yeah, I mean, I, I believe it's more opportunity to monetize um, a lot of uh, opportunities. Yeah. 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 It's not that you're going to let it go because of either you don't have money or you don't have a team or whatever. If you're a realtor, I guess you can just monetize on my yeah. So that's the way I took it. And yeah, it's, it's been good. You know, maybe I don't close 30, 40 deals a year. 
but I know that I can get a little bit older. Is that any better? Yeah. 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 I know in one year, I think she did like 32, but it wasn't okay, this year. That's a lot. Yeah, but she, it was, and she became high contagion. But that was just one year, because I know then it dropped to, I think, 22, and then to 12, so and then went, the, yeah. To get to that level, How do you feel about that? Yeah, so I believe it's not easy, and it just depends uh, in what, I guess, what your price range. All right, because so most of it, she did it in the market, which is 250, 300, so of course, it's more volume yeah, in there. Yeah. She did have her few million dollar homes there, here and there, but it took a longer sell. So, yeah, it'll take a bit longer, yeah. Just like commercial agents, they might close three or four a year, but it's bigger, you know, it's bigger. Yeah, way bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can pick, honestly. Uh, the way I do it, I don't know, I just want to get serious people. So whatever they want, if they're serious enough that they want to sell or yeah, buy, they'll work with them, you know. If I feel they're not serious, I'll just recommend to somebody else and even get a vision from that. Yeah. Be like, you know, because I don't, it's going to sound rude, but I don't want to have, I don't want everybody to have access to me because I believe that a lot of people don't appreciate your time to try and extend. No, you know? Sound rude. So, mm -hmm. You know, so I know when I was on the investor side, when I was working real time, I know I gave her a hard time. Good thing is she get paid two or even three times work with me. Right here. Yeah. You know, so I just make sure she wants to take me down. But that just me doesn't mean everybody can think the way I do. You know, so do you work more with like buyers or sellers? As for now, I'm working with more buyers. It's because inventory is low. I don't yeah. have that much sellers right now. I had I, I I was working with more sellers than when I started in November, but like as of today, I have like seven buyers in the pipeline and probably like two sellers. Gotcha. That's it. Yeah. Well, um, I don't know if it'll help you at all. I don't know if you've ever heard of our program, but owner we do owner financing, but it's not a traditional way of owner financing. We basically match up like buyers and who can't qualify and. Okay. So, oh, so if you need a backup option ever for any of your buyers that you work with, like if a deal falls through because they can't qualify, or mm -hmm. if you just are working with people who are cash heavy and have all the cash but don't have the credit or whatever, um, our program can help them. Sounds good. Yeah. I mean. It, ma it makes more sense to buy a house now because they're like, why am I paying this amount for rent when my mortgage could be the same or probably lower? Yeah, so they're just like, let me just take I the mean, risk. I less than putting taxes and insurance in most cases. Mm -hmm. like, so. Hey, Donna. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, maybe once you get out to like Fort Bend, that's a little so, different, but... What's the name of your uh, program? Yeah. Uh, the owner finance company. The owner finance company. Yeah. So how do like let's say I have like a, a buyer who doesn't qualify for traditional funding? Thank you. How would that um, actually work? Um, basically, they just come to us for pre-approval. The only thing that we we require we require for pre-approval is a valid ID or passport, um, proof of funds, and uh, our application. Which our application is really short. Um, that's it. That's all we have for pre-approval. And basically, once you're pre-approved, like we're going to move forward with you no matter what. So that's all they have to have to qualify for our passport, proof of funds, and our application filled out, which is. It's just like a one page application. The second and third page is just information about our um, process, but it's basically just one page. Um, 
So yeah, that's it. That's all they have to have. They basically can go find any home they'd like on the MLS. We can provide a pre-approval letter. And as long as they have the proof of funds, we're, we're good to go on our end. Once they find a home and get it under contract, they bring it to us. We have a group of pre-approved investors that we work with, or sometimes we do the deals ourselves, just depending. But uh, basically, we assign the deal over to our investor. Sometimes it's through an assignment contract. Sometimes we write a whole new contract. New builds, we usually do a whole new contract. But um, we assign it over to our investor, whatever way that works. And then our investor purchases the property as an investment loan. And then they basically go through the normal traditional process. We, they're already pre-approved with lenders that they work with since we do a lot of deals with a lot of different investors. But they do the normal closing. They close with the title company. The same day of the title company closing, we do a second closing at our office with our closing attorney and notaries. Um, they sell the property to the owner finance company. And then the very next day, we do a third closing back to the end buyer who we pre-approved in the Kill my keto. And the owner too. finance company, owner finance is it to them. So, I'm so I'm 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 there's I'm technically I'm like three closings per deal. I mean, but it still works out for somebody who wants to have a property. I have to take this one. Oh, but yeah, so it helps. Yeah, them. absolutely. Right. And we don't, and for people who want to own a home, I mean, we don't charge any prepayment penalties. They have to hold the note for at least 18 months. But outside of that, they can refi whenever they want. Yeah, they nice can, um, do whatever they like. So it's pretty good. We don't add any purchase. We don't add anything to the purchase price of the home. We just our fees are five percent across the top, like of the purchase price. Of the purchase price is it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's. it's I mean, a good and in option. terms of down payment, what is the minimum they should have? Um, the very minimum is fifteen percent. Okay. It used to be ten, and we're working to hopefully get back to that towards the end right of the now. year. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully we'll get back to that toward the end of the year. Um, it used to be 10, but right now it's 15. Okay. I, I might have a buyer then. I'll probably send you to you guys. He yeah. has he has 13%. Well, oh, he's trying to save up to 20. Yeah. Um, but because I was trying to help him do it more like a lease to own mm-hmm. type type of type of deal because I've done that in the past. Yeah. So I was trying to help him to, to do that right now, but not everybody is accepting that. People want their cash right now and they just want to move out. Yeah. So it's been kind of challenging for them. Even that's hard right now. So yeah. I was just like, oh, okay. But I, I haven't heard any owner finance company, so okay, that, that really helps. Yeah, no, it definitely does. I mean, our what they have to put down right now, it is a lot. But most of our buyers, you know, they, they don't qualify for you know, loaning. They're mm-hmm. higher risk. So that's why we have to do I did good for lunch. I just had salmon. But it's right. good because at one point... They're closer I to feel better. BMI. I had, yeah. yeah, I so didn't go. So none, none of our homes the fog went out of my have head. To, they have to put BMI because even if they only bring 15% or even 10, our so investors fog, put down the head. remaining part to get to 20%. Fog, like brain fog. Oh, okay. So they never have to do I thought BMI. that was just normal. Like, we'll stay in the long term. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. the only reason why I stay so on. So that's like a really, that's a big deal for a lot of our people. They don't Otherwise, it's not really, I like craft beer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it works out well. Um, yeah, if you have any buyers that you think would need our help, mm-hmm. so we had our realtor training today where we kind of just go really in depth into each step, let our realtors ask lots of questions, and we're going to try to do them monthly, so maybe you could come to our next one. Uh, that'll be good. Uh, what days are we doing? Well, we just started our first one this year. We had okay. done Never Get It Us, you know, when we first opened the company, which was in 2019, and then 2020, we basically worked a lot too many. So this was our first one for this year, but we're planning to start doing the training for this one. Yeah, and we can email you um, just some information about yeah, the that'll, that'll be perfect. It just opens you guys up to a little bit more of a market. So more options, yeah. Yeah, yeah just more options. Yeah. And as a listing agent, you can put owner financing available on your list. List. Yeah, listings. So, you know, a lot of people who are searching for particularly two owner financing, there's only one, like, I think mean, 5% of even of listings that have that. Yeah, you give them more options. Because yeah, I believe yeah. the more options you give them, um, you know, they're more tend to work with you. Yeah. But that's, I guess, that's one of the reasons why I was kind of. 
I don't want to say lucky, but I, it helped me a lot when I started last year. It was because because I'm a home instructor as well. I just don't use it as much. I just use it for the knowledge. So them knowing that I know that, you know, I'll just I'll give them more, more yeah, more comfortable yeah. in, in certain things. I mean, I want to. I, I tell them I'm not going to give up professional advice because I can't strike, you yeah. know. But you know, if I were you, once once you get an inspection, you you know, just ask them to look more into these things right yeah. here. So that helps a lot. Yeah, you know, no, when you have more does. options. Credibility and more mm -hmm. options. Um, and it's the same. Like since our investors end up closing, I mean, they're still an appraisal and all of that done so we in essence don't ever even see the event like so uh, and neither does our investor unless they want to yeah, yeah. They want to check it out yeah, yeah. They're just, generally speaking, yeah. yeah we have a lot of um 1099 people last year because Not like that. they like people who were going through loans, they fell through because, like, once COVID happened, they either lost their jobs, and so oh, yes. their underwriting completely fell through, and they didn't want to lose the house. So we had a lot of 1099 buyers last year just like, because of COVID and stuff. Yeah. They cut them off like the last week or two of their loan process. They were like, no. Yeah, I mean, it all comes down to is it. Fannie Mae guidelines. Yeah. Otherwise, they're going to get stuck with a lot. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, they don't have a choice for their underwriting guidelines or, you know. Right. And what are y'all's rates for like 10 years? All of our rates are the same. Every year is 30 year fixed 9.9. Everything is. I've heard there's no doc bonds back. Um, they're probably around that rate, too. They're, they're a little bit lower, I think, the no doc bonds. The like, no doc ones that our last investor did was 5.75. Yeah. Why are no doc lower than 10.9? Like, if they're going through an LLC, those are like the for our investors that go do all their deals through LLCs, they're in like 5.7, but it's like they don't provide any docs, it's just like all based on. Yeah. Normally, they'd be getting 3 to 3.5 if they go the LLC route. Yeah, but I mean, if you're a small business owner, it's. And you want to save cash. Yeah. And otherwise, you got to be like a 50% down. You got a juicy. Yeah. You got a juicy. I think that some of those loans, like a few of them that we did have, they required an additional 5% down. And so some of them had to put like 25% down with our program. The end buyer's bringing part of that and the investor's bringing part of that. So it's technically like for the end buyer who really wants the home can, can be our program in those cases can be less of a down payment than some of those no doc ones, like if they're requiring more down. I, I'm thinking, just thinking more more selfishly, like for ourselves, like self-employed, yeah. you know, it comes a challenge. But that three, that two, three percent, when you deal with like new home prices, I actually thought it ends up being a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. It can be a lot. It, it's crazy what sure. like two percent mortgages can do to prices. Yeah, most that like no, no inventory. Our ten ninety nine people, unless they've like been in the same ten ninety nine job for what I think like two over two years over or two three years, yeah. something, unless they've been in the exact same ten ninety nine job, and then even before that, I think they have to show like five years of like. Their 1099 income can't qualify for traditional. Yeah. It's crazy. Like, I was 1099 in oil and gas before we started this company. And it's like, I could qualify, but only because I was in it for five years. Like, that's, like, it's crazy. Like, You're better off working at McDonald's. From a bank living standpoint, you are. Like, no matter what, like, whatever you're making, if you're W2, you're better off. Like, it doesn't matter what you're making in 1099. You basically have to show five years worth of income at 1099. It's insane. Okay. What, what are you talking um, about? I can go five. I flipped four, four houses while in college. But um, like then I got a sales job in Houston. 2011 from trying to kick things off again. 2014 was like, trying to get more serious about it. And then 2015 was like, oh, for Diplo? 14 is when I got a license. You've been with ESP ever since? 
I was the champion. The table was inside. It was just. The table was inside. I didn't do it for any type of. Oh, okay. That was all they had. Yeah, they were just. It's DVM all access. Yeah. Uh, yeah. EXP yeah. just kind of came at the right time that we were looking to create more full streams of income because our bucks would get harder to make it harder. Yeah. And we were going to do ring. Yeah. We were actually. We had agents on our team. Yeah, we're, we're we were outsourcing our books to We brought that in house. And the EXP kind of came along. And then we're also like. To change, really perfect timing. I know back in November when I was uh, looking at what brokers to join, I actually saw you. I was like, yeah. <laughs> Are you with XP? Yeah, I'm with XP now. But um, at that time, uh, Larry, I don't know if you heard of him, Larry White. I know, I, I know him from Facebook. Yeah, um, it's either Facebook or in, uh, LinkedIn. Well, I, I saw him on Facebook. Okay. Yeah, he got that with Facebook. I'm good for now, thanks. So, yeah, I see him on there, but I don't know him personally. Yeah, he's, he's local. He's, yeah, he's at Katie. He lives in Katie. Yeah, so, you know, he came on and you know, he started basically explaining how, how great he was and everything. It kind of made sense to me because I was looking into Kelvin's mostly because they say, oh, they're training, it's top notch and stuff. Yeah. But then I saw that. Uh, EXP was something similar, just more personalized. Yeah. I was like, well, that's good because you know every agent is different. And they're looking to different things. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> so it's just like on a financial side, it's cheaper on, on for EXP and you get the training, which is more personalized to you. So I was like, well, it makes sense. You know, I wasn't sure if in terms of level of prestige, it, it, it matched on Keller Williams, but I was like, well, the training for me was 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 a good one. No one cares. Yeah. No one cares <laughs> what broken people are. Well, with few exceptions, like niche, niche, like like you're the go-to luxury agent for high-rise townhomes and whatever. Like, no, no. That may matter. I don't know. Otherwise, no one's gonna say, "Hey, I don't like you because you're at the max." Are you ever seeing people? It's like, it's like yeah. Yeah. they either like you or they don't. They trust you or they don't. And at the end of the day, it's like. Like your brother helps you, but you are the brand. And now, 20 years ago, that was the, the, drive out there. the internet, you are the brand. Yeah, you're the brand. Yeah. You're yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's what I was talking with another agent today. Crushing it. Crushing it. Like, luxury. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, so the, the brand, it's not that yeah. they don't matter. Yeah. I mean, Keller Williams is a long term history. They're a great company. There is value that comes with that. At the end of the day, like, she's leaving client, but they don't really time, care. We like, care about, like, what can you do for me? And actually, we were laughing and last night. She's like, I'm surprised we've been able to make it in one bedroom apartment this long. And you have and ownership. Like, I do. It's actually, you like, lean like, on the company? Good luck. They have to leverage. That's the thing. Like, it's, it's cool to lean on it if you want to, but you know, if you don't build your personal brand, you'll always be. You always have to have that. And they have all the leverage. You can't go anywhere. You build a big enough brand, you have the leverage. You go anywhere, they'll follow you. Yeah, you can go anywhere, and then hey, maybe you're an HP, maybe you be five years from now does something that you don't like, and then now you're like. A yeah, compass, a color, a whatever. Like, yeah. What are you gonna do? Very, very Maybe someone writes your check. I um, got a couple of so so That's <laughs> what creating your own personal brand. Like, it's a personal, yeah, and this is not that. real to you. Uh, uh, exclusive. This is anywhere. Anywhere. Yeah. Anywhere. You're working <laughs> as a well, tech dev for Apple. Well, what kind of brand are you building on YouTube or TikTok? She where up, dude, if I your don't, course is if running I Apple, like, you need to make your next move. Well, no how are you going to get Google to really pay attention to you? Like, is it because you've got 30,000 followers on TikTok? Maybe they'll write you a bigger check. I, I don't know. Or maybe, you, you know, you get phased out or you get tired. Well, now you got leverage because you're making three grand a month from YouTube. No, it was and you really need it. Knowing Jordan, so in the beginning, right? you know, Harmon walked in before class. You know how we were like that. Personal brand. That's, that's the evolution so that this song is in. Everyone has to have a personal brand. Be yourself. Be yourself. Be yourself. That's it. Be yourself. Be authentic. Not everyone's going to be the Grant Cardone. Like the big out in front. But not everyone has to be. You could be nerdy on 
Pokemon, and like like Pat Flynn. You know Pat Flynn? He has podcasts. So the smart has yeah. been from uh, FBI. So he's he's, he's got, like one of the OGs of podcasting. He's been doing it for years. And, uh, he got into it like in LA, so he got laid off. And started doing podcasts. But anyway, it's good. I'm sure he makes a lot of money from it. And uh, I mean, if he's still doing it, but uh, no, no, he's he's definitely still doing it. So he's got a good point. He just recently started a Pokemon podcast. Well, he's only suffering. And he's got like 20,000 followers on YouTube just from Pokemon. Wow. Like, I mean, he's not making six figures from that. He's maybe got a little income, but I don't know. He just started that. So what does that look like six years or two years from now? Now, oh, you make it so yeah, right. now when some type of Pokemon game comes out, they want him to talk about it. Like, maybe they write him a five grand check for an hour to talk about Pokemon. Like, you can do that for like Gary B with wine. Um, or there's probably beer. Like talking about your favorite beers and do what you're doing. Think about it if you recorded yourself drinking beer for 30 minutes a day, every day, tasting craft brews all the world. Like, it's interesting to people. So some people find it interesting, and it just a matter of time before it just keeps going. But but some people in a global economy is is a big number. So 30 years from now, it's like some people was your group of high school friends that you all just got together and played magic or basketball or it's a small niche group. Now if you nerd out on even the smallest of things, that's a big number. When you look at the global, it's just weird. Uh, that's a global economy. That's that's why brand is the, the internet monopolized uh, or uh, commoditized everything. Everything breaks down as you can build personalized brand on those next things. It takes time, it takes effort. You're not gonna be a millionaire overnight. You're not gonna have well, so most people are not gonna be like Ryan's world where they have millions of followers of you know, boxes, but maybe you make it's talk about the model of your they yeah. don't so, the crazy concepts that we're using here just like aren't really crazy <laughs> so long as you like it and for me it's life changing I mean, you get in favor of something you like yeah, you, you know, enjoy doing, doing it like so you work 45 hours a week you're talking to Kate so you get to go to the side gate that actually you versus you just go home and hate job then you turn on that place mind not me yeah it's a brief reset but that's like I'm never in yeah you wake up the next day you do the same thing yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, like, I don't know, almost 14 or 16, I would so, say, but... You found this in LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, LinkedIn, I, I was doing nothing on LinkedIn probably six months ago. Oh, six months ago? Okay. And um, you know, they've got a little bit more social on there, so they're like, oh, okay, I'll go play back in. No, we've been doing, like, whatever the answer is, is we've been doing more. Like, yeah, because the first one that I saw, I think it was episode two that I saw on LinkedIn. Actually, the, I saw on YouTube. The Real Estate Hacking Live. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then today, I actually was coming to Dallas. And as soon as, as soon as I hit um, the Woodlands, I received an email about I'm going to be live. I was like, you know, I need to go there. <laughs> Definitely got to be there. Just a good stuff. Yeah. Where do you live at? Uh, Medical Center. Okay. I, I was I was just in Dallas more. Like, I was trying to get more uh, recruit more agents for uh, ESP just to start building my pipeline on that. So I just went there for two days, and today I came back like early in the morning. I was like, I got nothing else. I'm just gonna go back home. So when I was going to the woods, I received an email. I was like, Oh, let me here's our big So I'm here. You uh, when did you join? Uh, January. Yeah, but I was uh, in November. I was with the Doug Harity group. Um, yeah, I never so it's a, it's a small, yeah, it's small. They're in humble. Yeah, I just joined because the best friend introduced me to it. But then I was just like, uh, I, just know. I like that because it's, they're really cool people who work in like the environment in the office. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I'm going. I mean, I spoke with some of them there. They're like, nah, I'm not eating. I've been here all my life. I'm like, I'm the broker. Yeah, actually, I should. Actually, I should. Yeah, because he used to be with Keller Williams. And, he was like, now I'm going to do my own thing. The, the, the indie broker model is it's, it's, it's adult babysitting with no scale. 
So you have all the pain, all the financial liabilities, uh, all the stress. With there's some financial benefits, but most people have a hundred plus agents. They have to sell. There's no way to make money. If you look at that, there's a scale and then offload all the headaches on the corpus. They're not aware of it. Because my sponsor, or not my sponsor, one of them, Pat Hayes, so he's he left any broker. And then, I don't know, it was a year or two, three years later, it was broker. They're coming. <laughs> 900 <laughs> agents of brokerage in uh, Arizona. Wow. This is last year. I mean, every day on LinkedIn, I hear people saying, 300 agents joined today. 400 agents. I'm like, wow. 1,000 agents a week? It's just, to be honest, 100,000 like that. You're ready, you should be cool. That's pretty cool. Double. Yeah, double nine months. Yeah. <laughs> Nuts. <laughs> Nuts. <laughs> that baby company. It's, uh, right. It's just different. I think just because it's just different, that I, I guess everybody, and I think COVID kind of helped too, because now everything's like work from home, Zoom, and stuff like that. And I always hate, so now since it's already ESP is already doing it, people are thinking, well, if I'm not going to be going to the office, I mean, why am I going to be paying all this fee? Worldwide, all industries move the timeline up to all based operations for like 10 15 years. That evolution of the economy and the intended if we were just very fortunate oh, that we were already there. We were already there. From an operational standpoint, no change. Okay. Individually, just so your local level, maybe you had to do some, like, some like, things different. Yeah. Yeah. We're already in the cloud, training didn't interrupt, but y'all, it's all the same. <laughs> Where everyone else had to kind of figure things out and jump on the yeah. 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 Uh, Facebook video, something, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's what it is. It's, uh, it's just business, it changes. And eventually, something will interrupt that. Everything gets interrupted over time. I mean, Amazon, even Jeff Bezos says, because Amazon will get disrupted at some point. Some kid's going to think of something. Okay, so I think right now, I'm going to file and take one more Just like y'all were saying, I'm pretty sure they're going to be real soon. If, if, if they're not even, I really thought they already were. It makes it easier for them to get into mortgages and other financial services. Um, that, that's easy, more easily scale. But, uh, I, I thought they were trying to do something like McDonald's trying to do. Like they try to, you know, McDonald's, they most of the money they make it through real estate. They buy all these places and they franchise it to somebody and they charge the living hell out of you just to have their brand on that spot they bought. You know, so I was, I was thinking they're actually going to go that route. Probably they're going to franchise the supermarket or something and just going to charge you high rent on, on their brand name, basically. You know, so, so yeah. yeah, the Amazon Web Services, that's been. Biggest most of the products on there, like, I don't know. But it's actually like, smart, too, because it makes it harder for them to be off, I think, in the government. So they can have a monopoly. They don't. There is the platform. They don't sell all the time. It's actually common pop shops. It's pretty smart. So you normally do, I would say, she's like, if not, like realtor and investor, or you just kind of have to together? No, we're not really finding anything right now. Which one more to do the projects? I'll flip so, if I see a good deal. She's like, I'm talking about like more than my like, like, yeah, 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 like, yeah, like, Don't so sell the cash cow. Right yeah. <laughs> or don't kill the cash cow. Like, like, don't kill it, eat it. Like, so, it for a while. Said, well, it's a thing grow. It it get fast. Really, yeah, so many of them. So, actually, all of our best deals have been wrong. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, now. Oh, I don't know if it will. And I don't care if it doesn't sell. But if it does, we pay 75 for it. So, how much are you put uh, uh, How much are you How much are you put? 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 How much are she said, give me five minutes. I'm going to like look uh, over real quick again. Oh, my God. And then we got a call for it. I guess. Basically, let me see. You go, you do a rehab, you keep it for two or four, maybe five years. I call it the slow foot trip. So, what I put you do is five. You got to make your money now. All your numbers are going to be tight. So, the slow foot strategy is right and right. Three to five years. You look at your portfolio. Pick the weakest one. Maybe the maybe it's the head, or maybe it's an appreciating so much taxes are are killing the company. So that was just pick that piece and you buy two or three more. Turn one and I'll do two three. So you do that every single year. You buy one. Buy one, buy one, so 10 years you get 10. But, say you start eating year five, or you're well, so if I got this case from Apple, and it's like mad, you know, the little bag charger thing I have, it's like made for this case, so I don't have to take off the case, and I'll pass it to the I was fine with it. Because they should, like, the other case has traded in We've done it. We no, she traded. No, she traded. We it in two. a couple rounds. I just wish. Well, they didn't give her. I would have done that before. They didn't I would have not built out the operation. She only traded in two. And they were all these. So the two she turned in were all these. So, like, no, like on the 11th, she turned in, the whole back was crap. She had an and it was it was packed the no, whole no, entire no, back. No. Grant Cardone said that the clubhouse. There's like there's all you wholesalers out there. You're getting tired of the property. Cheaper than it costs to build them. Why are you selling those for pennies? You'll make twenty grand or whatever on a contract. Which most wholesalers probably make it five ten. Um, why you get them? You can't build them. You can't build them. You can't build them. And now, not, not only can they not build them, there's just not that going to buy a resale. So, yeah, at least not now. No. And they're printing money like crazy, so it's your hedge. Okay, whatever this was, your hedge against inflation. <laughs> well, as well as you're going to do. Okay, then we probably already. I guess if you believe in the stock market or Bitcoin or. Um, um, never believe in the stock market. Let's get my distance from it. Oh, I mean, I wish I was invested in Amazon and and Bitcoin back then. Yeah, you know, but this is from stock market. Don't work out the average gain over a period of time you win. The people who lose are the ones who pick. Then you get twenty percent. You get about so Tony Robbins. I haven't read the book. I heard the podcast on the book. He was like, Clinton was like, guys, the billionaires. And then they go in statistics. It's like if you were the smartest investor, this is like exactly the time to buy and sell. But you miss just like even some of the days of a few of those. Then you get there. Now you're like actually below market. Models are going to be. So yeah. if you knew exactly the 2008s and all this stuff, you so a couple of them in your life, and you just miss it a little bit, and now you're below out. This is cheaper. It was the bigger index. Probably it. Probably it. more risk. And last year, the one about that caliber. It's not everybody's one. Yeah. That's normal. That's just once in a lifetime talent. It's a guy who's willing to look at the time and find useful. That's still set great. Most people are going to do so. You go in back. Yeah. I like girls. I like girls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is like? What is my?
Oh, it's free drug. Like, Your wife yeah. in the research as well? <laughs> I need a cash. I was older. Very personal, very sincere. It's that natural empathy. Yeah. Um, so she's been one on one with full investment business since the get go. Then we had kids, so it's been like balancing that. It's been a whole. But now that they're older, like older, they'll be seven and five this summer. So, but I mean, older, they're in school. I don't think it was a okay. No, it was a good one. So she's more actively involved. No, it was a good one. What we're doing with these kids is helping with that. No, it was a Pretty excited about that. No, it wasn't. It was a good one. So, you know, not that way, you know. Were there from her 30 years? How many agents? Do you have agents on your team? Yeah, actually, in the team that I work with, uh, it's only three of us for now. I um, already bought like, three agents under me, like under the speed. Um, so I normally, what I try to do, I try to produce the lease for them, at least the first three for each of them, just um, send it up to them, because I know right now it's going to be tough. So I normally try to produce the lease, send it to them, and I'll just tell them. No, who has their contact up to the hotel room? No, just tell them just for you to get going. Because if you not to explain them, the benefit me is going to benefit you if I help you guys to, I don't want to say make it easier for you guys, but at least to give you some type of motivation. Like I said, you still got to do the work to close the deal. I'm just gonna do a heavy lift. I think it was. I think it was because just like you were saying, like the only thing they teach in real school is stay out of jail. Like they don't teach you anything else. So I know we try to do it. So at least, like I said, the first three leads to do that for them, and so they can learn. How many transactions do you have? Uh, This year, I have five. I don't know what the the threshold is, but. It sounds like maybe being a mentor might be good for you too. I mean, you're kind of doing that anyway. You're yeah. Mm-hmm. So and you'll get a split, uh, a small split, you get where your mentees get the first three transactions. Um, but if you have a production team, then by default you'll be their mentor. So oh, it's the same thing. But, um, yeah. yeah. It's been helpful for folks. I'm not a mentor, but there are certain agents that are not. <laughs> then they have, you know, they have a lot of them. So I just, you know, I used to do that for them. I got to just get them to put them to work, get them inspired a little bit. So I know it could be discouraging when the you know, first deal is so important. Yeah. And then so I know it might go, what, six months? You don't have a deal when you start it. I know that's going to discourage anybody. I go discourage myself, you know? You know, but she tried to do that for them. Yeah, that's fun. Um, it was a lot. It's hard when you're staffing this for you to work with. Mm-hmm. And if you're working with new buyers in construction, there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, I target a lot of for sale by owners. Yeah, I normally target I target a lot of those. And you know, expire. You know, the, what, the, what I will do is um, I'll look at the email list, except for expires. I'll look for a demo for that. And then I'll just trace uh, the yeah. address. Just get a phone number or whatever. Well, normally, I try to get a, a address, and normally I'm just I just send them something on value. Like I'll send them a book, basically saying how can you start your house on your own, something like that. And then the way that I'm, I I market it, so I'll send that to their to their to their own business. And then if I have an email, then I'll just put them on a drip and get okay before. Just keep that aside. And, you know, I'm using service like Rex. I haven't I've heard of Rex. I haven't used it yet. I mean, I'm planning on using it. It comes with phone numbers. Oh, okay. It's got its own uh, dialing system. Oh, okay. Um, I never used that. I had racks. And that's where, like, the money um, We were using it for investment. Investment business. Um, I don't even know. Agents swear by it. I just say it's giving you one the data and then two clients. And then you can, it has a way you can filter. And I will tell them that and I'll like Especially with expired. You kind of know location, you know, price ranges. So, like, you don't want to call the million dollar phone. Like, you can call the $250 phone. The average price you have. So, when they call, I yeah. normally go yeah. and I'll For be sure. straightforward okay, with them. I basically tell them, this is how it works. 
you want traffic okay. sold, okay. you have to be within this and this price. Okay. It's based on data that we have, the same data that probably like, Appraise is going to use, same data that the is going to use, same data that almost everybody uses. I guess I call this is how it goes. So, yeah. If they like the way I work, then we move forward. If not, then no hard no, feelings. I like to be straightforward with them. Some don't like it, but at the end of the day, it, if it didn't sell, it's to something like, else. You know. <laughs> so. well, a lot of them, it, it didn't sell. See, the title issues, they're priced way out of market. That's usually the case. For one, we don't. They weren't serious enough. Uh, the, this? Yes. Oh, is that for you? I didn't order one, but they brought okay, me one. Okay, I already, okay, yeah. yeah, I yeah, took a few sips. Fine. You probably don't want to know. Chris, you want some of this? Uh, I may get some in a minute. I'm going to go to the restaurant. No, no, no. Mark didn't answer. Do we get permission to call? No, I'm going to call. And then, yeah. Then, yeah. Um, should I just wait on Shari? I'll do a little water. So basically, we're giving him a free deal? Yeah, the That's pretty sweet. First, first, dude. What's the cash flow like, If you can get a 3.5 or 500, you know how easy it is to pull money from the federal government? I was just fucking around on the website. Have <laughs> you seen how easy it is to get the money out of it? Really? Yeah, really? It's it's crazy. Crazy. FEMA, FEMA directs you to SBA loan. Dude, it's crazy. So you don't have Which to provide any collateral for a loan of at least $25,000. You just put in there like, oh, I got one employee. Uh, I was impacted. Submit. They're like, you can follow this fucking Really? It's like 3%. No, it really is. It really is. That's why I'm just going to use one. Yeah. Like, just It was a guy. He was able to fraud, defraud the system at $7 million. He's got a mansion. And I mean, it would be a couple like of cars out of the time and caught on it. For like Obviously, last year, since 2019, just got a mansion. Oh, seven million dollars just living. Like taking What a great life, though. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Nobody here. Nobody here. Nobody here. Nobody here. I would take the seven million and then immediately go to Costa Rica, somewhere where you can't get it. It's high. You know what? Good luck. And then we would deed it to some Right. Dude, if you watch that operation with Yeah, yeah. That's what we're talking about. That's a great show. So technically, I guess we could with you for Willie. We could. We could do it for Willie. Or for me. I feel like for me, it would match the race. I guess that thing's still on. You're going to kill it? It's up to you, man. I didn't realize. So, what is that? What is that? What is that? 